you ever relocated from close family to another state or country? It can be a fun and enlightening experience, or it could be just the opposite. If you think about your decision to relocate, I suspect that your motive or move was set in motion by a job, a better natural environment, or cultural, including political reasons. How about your belief system? When you decided to move, were you confident that God was going to ensure that your move would lead to a better day for you and yours? A number of modern observers think that the religious motive to migrate only occurred in the United States during the 1800s. As you may recall, the idea of manifest destiny was coined by, in 1845 by the Irish-American journalist John L. O'Sullivan. He described manifest destiny as a belief among Americans that God's providence had ordained the expansion of the United States from sea to shining sea. As you'll see today on the vantage point, there's evidence that the geopious sentiments that support the idea of an American manifest destiny or Western expansion go much further back into colonial days. I hope you'll join me. For people to believe that another place has been set aside by God for them, they have to accept a pious view toward that space, which I call geopiety. In colonial times, geographies of the imagination were not often formed by first-hand experiences. As, we see, as we'll see today, though, there were certainly colonial pioneers like Daniel Boone who had the opportunity to see new lands in return to tell others about them. Pioneers' motives and geopious beliefs can be found in letters, sermons, and other writings. By looking at those artifacts, we can see how an unknown number of colonial folks saw the hand of God in their decisions to seek new and better lands. For example, an 18th century Virginia minister wrote, and I quote, What a bustle is amongst people about Kentuck. To hear people speak of it, one would think it was a newfound paradise, end of quote. The minister told his congregation that heaven is a Kentucky kind of place. In reflecting on the Irish Protestant diaspora of the 18th century, a writer from Northern Ireland named Billy Kennedy wrote this thought about the site of the first Presbyterian congregation in Tennessee Valley. It was built back in 1782. And I quote, Standing beneath the cedar trees and alongside the four-pillared plinth, which marks the spot of the original Leban in the Fork Church, one is struck immediately by the awesome reverence in the place. The beauty of the encircling countryside sets it out as a spot close to heaven. This was once a church in the wildwood, a sanctified acre where God's faithful servant Samuel Carrick brought the gospel to a people searching for a new destiny in the wilderness of the frontier, but desperately eager to reclaim the Presbyterian faith of their fathers." End of quote. You might find it interesting that the historic foundations of the University of Tennessee, Peyton Manning's alma mater, were laid by the same Reverend Samuel Carrick back in 1794 when he served as the founding president of Blunt College, which grew into the University of Tennessee. Not all the people who ventured west into the 18th century backcountry were of direct Irish or Scottish descent. Nope, they sure weren't. Daniel Boone was not a Scots-Irishman, but he was certainly absorbed into its community in Appalachia. Being born into a Pennsylvania Quaker family, it's not too difficult to think of Boone as a second-generation Englishman. But what's often overlooked is that Sarah Morgan, his mother, was Welsh, and many of the people with whom Boone formed relationships were of Irish or border Anglo-Scottish or Welsh descent. His wife Rebecca, for instance, was a Welsh girl. Each of those ethnic groups came from the Celtic fringes of Great Britain and Ireland, and in Ulster, as well as in the backcountry, they formed the basic Protestant population. Daniel Boone was unchurched in any formal sense. When a Baptist minister asked him if he had ever experienced any change in his feelings toward the Savior during his lifetime, he answered, No, sir, I always loved God ever since I could recollect. It could be argued that he was expressing a belief in predestination because he unequivocally declared a preference for Presbyterianism. Perhaps John Finley, the man who inspired Boone to see Kentucky, and other Scots-Irish friends and in-laws, inspired Boone on a deep spiritual level as well. There's no doubt that Finley ignited Boone's imagined geography of Kentucky and the West, yet little attention has been given to colonial-era perceptions of sacred spaces and their impact on migration. 
Boone's beliefs were clearly revealed in a letter he wrote to his sister-in-law, Sarah Day Boone, and they are romantically depicted in his authorized biography that was published as an autobiography by John Filson in 1784, the year in which Boone celebrated his 50th birthday. This seems to have been a happy and reflective time for him. His problems with debtors and his move to Missouri were still some years ahead. One of Daniel Boone's frequent companions in the wilderness was his brother, Squire, who had served as a lay Baptist preacher for most of his adult life. In recalling conversations with Boone out on the backwoods, Boone expressed his belief in the providential aspects of place and the peace he felt in recognizing it. And I quote, Thus situated many hundreds of miles from our families in the howling wilderness of Kentucky, I believe few would have equally enjoyed the happiness we experienced. I often observed to my brother, you see now how little nature requires of us to be satisfied. Felicity, the companion of content, is rather found in our own breasts than in the enjoyment of external things, and I firmly believe it requires but a little philosophy to make a man happy in whatsoever state he is. This consists of a full resignation to the will of providence, and a resigned soul finds pleasure in a path strewed with briars and thorns. On another occasion in the western wilderness, Squire became frustrated with Daniel because he insisted that they patiently hunker down to sit out a storm. When the storm was over, they resumed their trek, and when they soon came upon an Indian camp vacated because of rising water, Boone turned to Squire and said, and I quote, See what fretted you so much was really the means of providence for our salvation. But for the storm, we should have run into the very jaws of our enemies." End of quote. Daniel Boone clearly held a view that God ruled and overruled in human affairs and secular events. In reflecting on the settlement of Kentucky in his 50th year, he told writer John Filson of his experiences. His reflections give us a glimpse into his geopious and geoteleological imagings. He clearly believed that colonists and then Americans would be blessed as they took part in Western expansion. And I quote, Curiosity is natural to the soul of man, and interesting objects have a powerful influence on our affections. Lo, these influencing powers actuate by permission or disposal of providence from selfish or social views. Yet in time the mysterious will of heaven is unfolded, and we behold our conduct from whatever motives excited, operating to answer the important designs of heaven. Thus we behold Kentucky, lately a howling wilderness, become a fruitful field. This region, so favorably distinguished by nature, now become the habitation of civilization at a period unparalleled in history, in the midst of a raging war, and under all the disadvantages of immigration to a country so remote from the inhabited parts of the continent. We now hear the praises and adorations of our Creator. We behold the foundations of cities laid that in all probability will equal the glory of the greatest upon earth. And we view Kentucky, situated on the fertile banks of the great Ohio, rising from obscurity to shine with splendor equal to any other star in the American hemisphere." End of quote. Boone's wanderlust continued despite his glowing observations of Kentucky. So by 1797, when he was in his 63rd year on earth, he and some of his family moved across the Mississippi River and settled in Missouri. Despite being up in his years, Boone continued to lead excursions into the western wilderness. He led hunting trips as far west as the plains of Oklahoma. As his years got the best of him, he died quietly at his Missouri home on September 26, 1820. Because Daniel Boone was a notable character, his views and observations on the American West no doubt played roles in the spread of the beliefs that historians now call Manifest Destiny. Clearly, Boone lived and died decades before the age of Manifest Destiny. This fights invites a larger question, how far back in time does migrating for the sake of faith penetrate our human story? Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video and will like, share, and subscribe to the channel. I look forward to seeing you again here on The Vantage Point. God bless you and yours. Bye-bye.